we have to talk about the Green Deal. Now, you all are very familiar with this particular, uh, with this particular graphic. Indeed, we've seen it again this morning. Um, and what I wanted to point out that at the center of the Green Deal, and I'll try to highlight it here, the Green Deal, what is absolutely central and key, it's about transformation, it's about the economy, and it's about our sustainable future. Now, really what it aims to do, the Green Deal, is to meet our 2030 and 2050 goals. We're all very familiar with those. And what we are seeing is that endless EU regulation uh, is being recast in the light of these, new, uh, uh, of these new objectives. And there are many, many initiatives and policies and new programs and ideas coming into play that are really totally related to, 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 um, to the Green Deal. Now, one of these is the taxonomy. And what does the taxonomy mean in the Green Deal? What is its purpose in the Green Deal? Essentially, as we saw, we all work in businesses. And all of our businesses are going to have to transform if we want to move to a more sustainable economy, the one that we are, that we are aiming for. And in order to do that, we need a common language. We need a common language to define what is sustainable, because as we know, definitions of sustainability can, can differ according to yeah, the sector, the company, the country, the geographic region, and, and that was clearly not functional. So the purpose of the taxonomy is to provide this common language. I would point out that the formal regulation, because it is a regulation, the taxonomy, it's not a directive, uh, which is often referred to as 2028-52, but it's actually on the establishment of a framework to facilitate sustainable investment. It is not, the word taxonomy is not mentioned in the name of the regulation. And also noted as an ESG regulation, in other words, it's about the environment, about the social requirements, and about governance all related to this common language. So really, what is the purpose of this common language? Well, essentially, it's to build a bridge between the investment community, because clearly we need trillions of euros of investment in order to, to transform our economy into the sustainable economy that we envisage and that we are aiming for. So the taxonomy gives us a set of technical screening criteria um, which are used to determine if your economic activity is environmentally sustainable or not. And there are six environmental objectives, two on climate change, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Those have been, uh, um, uh, the technical screening criteria for those were defined back in 2021 and companies are already starting to report in terms of those two objectives. But there are four others. There is what I would call sustainable water, circular economy, pollution prevention, and biodiversity, and, and uh, uh, those are the six altogether environmental categories. So what we see is that we get screening criteria in each case for the, the NACE codes, for the economic activities under each of these, of, of these objectives. And the, category, the, the screening criteria fall into two sorts. One is what do you have to be able to meet, what criteria do you need to meet in order to claim that you are making a substantial contribution to one of those objectives, and what criteria do you need to make, meet in order to demonstrate that you do no significant harm, frequently uh, abbreviated to DNSH, to the other five objectives. So how does it actually work? The key aspect of these technical screening criteria is that there are three points that have to be met. Each economic activity has to substantially contribute to at least one of the environmental objectives, and, and it has to do no significant harm to all of the five other environmental objectives, and it has to comply with the minimum social safeguards. The minimum social safeguards are essentially around business conduct and social performance uh, and the definitions or, 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 the, or the, the frameworks and the principles that are used here are the OECD's uh, multinational enterprises uh, guidelines and the UN's uh, guiding principles on, um, on, on business and, and, uh, 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 and human rights. And really, why do we include this minimum social safeguards? This is to avoid a situation 
where an economic activity is green and meets all of the technical screening criteria, but let's say there's something with human rights that's not very good, or with worker rights, maybe there's some bribery and corruption or some anti-competitive behavior or some in fact, tax is also included here under the minimum social safeguards. So there is some form of social behavior that is not in line with the ethics of the intention of the taxonomy. So just being green is not enough. You also have to comply with the minimum social safeguards. The point being here is that we have these kind of new categories. Well, SVHCs is not a new category for us, but most harmful substances certainly is. And then we have all the other substances, at least the other substances that are, that are registered. But what, is it, what does it look like in terms of the categories of chemicals that are referenced in the taxonomy? So in each of the, of, of the annexes that deals with, uh, uh, with climate change, mitigation and adaptation, with circularity, with biodiversity, and, and with, um, and, and with uh, um, sustainable water, there is an, an appendix. It's in each case, it's Appendix C. And Appendix C defines uh, uh, what is Dunos significant, significant harm, what are the technical criteria when it comes to the use and the placing on the market of chemicals. And essentially, the do, the do no significant harm category of category C, which is similar in, across, those different, um, across those different objectives of, 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 uh, uh, of the taxonomy, is that the activity does not lead to the manufacture, placing on the market, or the use of, and here we come to it, pops, Mercury and mercury compounds, ozone depleting substances, anything listed on the ROS list, Annex 17 of REACH. That was interesting for me to see that. Um, Article 57 of REACH, which we would ex accept, uh, expect. And then we have a little bit of variation. And this variation, I would point out, is something that we are seeing a lot. That this categorization of chemicals in various legislations it morphs, it, it changes, it kind of moves slightly with each new piece of legislation that comes up. And we see this here as well. So in, uh, in the Annex on Climate Change and, uh, of 2021 on climate change adaptation and mitigation, there is a reference to essential use. There is an exception to all of this if it can be demonstrated that the use is essential. But in the 2023 annexes, essential uses referenced slightly differently. What they say is we, we have all of these categories, A, B, C, D, E, F, and under F, it also has to be demonstrated that there are no suitable alternatives and that the use is under controlled conditions and, and that this chemical does not lead to the presence in the final product, right? of substances meeting the criteria essentially of Article 57 of REACH, except once again, if it can be demonstrated that no suitable alternatives are available and under control conditions. And in these annexes, the 2023 annexes, there's a little asterisk which says, on essential use, the commission reserves the right to change these exceptions, these exemptions, once the essential use criteria have been defined and published. So that's where we are. And what you can really see here, when you look at, at what's coming in terms of SVHCs, uh, most harmful substances, et cetera, et cetera, is that probably this list in the taxonomy is closer to what comes under most, most harmful substances. It's not a direct correlation. But the level of detail you need is going to be the level of detail that's going to be required for SVHCs. So, just looking at reach and what is coming is not sufficient to know what you need to know about your substances. You need to know your substances through the value chain. You need to know how they're used. You need to know their emissions throughout the value chain. These things are coming. We're going to move on now in my last, how many minutes do I still have? I can't see it. Two and a half. To talk <laughs> very briefly, clearly, uh, about green claims. Basically, the Green Deal uh, uh, and a number of, number of other initiatives, such as the new Circular Economy Ac uh, Action Plan, Sustainable Products Initiative, the new con Consumer ad Agenda, even the Green Deal Industrial Plan. These all refer to 
a couple of things. Empowering consumers to be part of the green transition and allowing them to make a better and a better informed choice in their purchasing decisions. Basically, we want to deal with greenwashing because false environmental claims are just as difficult in the consumer level and the green claims are about consumer products as you know, uh, um, uh, as can be complicated uh, uh, why we needed the taxonomy to, to provide a common language on sustainability. So there was some research undertaken and they found that 53% of, of claims on products and services, we're talking here about green claims, seemingly green claims, perhaps not actual green claims, uh, are making vague or misleading or unfounding statements. 40% have no supporting evidence. Consumer trust is extremely low. There is not a level playing field. It makes it much more complicated for businesses because there's more than 230 green labels in use in the EU, and about half of the, these have absolutely no verification. So clearly the, the, the intention is to change this. So what's new in this proposal? So, I've mentioned a number of things about the verifiable disclosures, about greenwashing. Um, obviously, it's going to contribute to a theme of this morning, which is the circular and green economy. It will help to have a, a level playing field so that this, is, this applies to imported products just as much as products manufactured in the EU. So all green claims will have to be, um, will have to be done according to the same, the same guidelines. Um, they're looking at, of course, their labeling schemes, which is, is quite relevant. But new things, and this is really new, the proposal is to include a system of independent, so in other words, by third parties, independent third parties, ex ante, Verification. This means you have to get an independent third party to verify your green claim before you can use it. And that verifier has to issue a certificate about the fact that it is in conformity. And also, very interestingly for me, this, um, this introduces a, a legal action option. So consumer organizations can bring collective actions against non-compliant traders. Rather uh, uh, interestingly, um, this, this gives you the much, the much the same sort of information. There will be additional rules for explicit environmental claims. Indeed, that is the name of this, uh, of this regulation, is regu uh, proposal, sorry, directive as an explicit environmental claims. We're looking at the labeling and we're looking, as I mentioned, at a new system of verification. So in conclusion, if you'll give me one minute, please, just to, to, to conclude on how to bring together these topics of the taxonomy and the green claims and what do they have in common. Obviously, they're both about they're both about uh, um, greenwashing, they're both about disclosures. Um, I think that what's interesting is that neither of those two, neither the taxonomy, which is a regulation of green claims, which is a proposed directive, have these words in the name of the title, so that's also something. And interestingly, they're both due to, be, uh, to become law, probably not this year, but in the first quarter of next year. We see that there's a categorization of chemicals that is not consistent, which I think is really important. They're both about the business of sustainability. And the elephant in the room, well, last week I would have said the name of this elephant was ED, so not endocrine disruptors, but emissions and disclosures. This week, after what we've heard about, about uh, uh, the REACH revision and particularly about authorization and restriction and what's going to be required in terms of upfront information, I think this elephant is now called EUD, Emissions, Uses and Disclosures. We have to know these throughout our value chains and we have to be prepared for the disclosures. Thanks very much for listening to me. For one minute extra, everybody. Thank you. Uh -huh.